Good morning and welcome to Meet the Festival. My name is Katherine Lang and I am the Education Administrative Manager at the Stratford Festival. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we, while we are coming together from various places, the territory where the Stratford Festival is situated is governed by two treaties, the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant of 1701 and the Huron Track Treaty of 1827. These lands and waterways have for generations been shared and cared for by the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Neutrals. And as I think about the people who have sat where I am over hundreds and thousands of years, I am so grateful for their care of this land that it enables me to enjoy living here now and working here now. And um, I take it as my responsibility to honor these treaties and to continually be learning how to be a better treaty partner. Um, so today we are joined by two of the artists from the cabaret, Why We Tell the Story, Marcus Nance and Vanessa Sears. This is Marcus's 10th season with the festival. This season, he is the curator and director of Why We Tell the Story. Other festival credits include Up Close and Musical, Voice of a Preacher's Son, Billy Elliot the Musical, Little Shop of Horrors, The Music Man, Crazy for You, Jesus Christ Superstar, Moby Dick, and My One and Only. Credits outside of the festival include La Boheme on Broadway, Sweeney Todd, Floyd Collins, and Pal Joy at the Shaw Festival, Wizard of Oz and Beauty and the Beast at the Grand Theatre, and Kismet and Of Thee I Sing with Encores in New York. Marcus has also done some work in film and television, appearing in shows such as Murdoch Mysteries, Departure, Prodigal Son, and The Producers. He is the winner of a Metropolitan Opera Award and is a Dora Award nominee. Now, this is Vanessa's third season with the festival, and this season she is one of the singers in Why We Tell the Story. Other festival credits include Up Close in Musical, That's How the Song Goes, Mum in Billy Elliot the Musical, and Ronette in Little Shop of Horrors. Credits outside of the festival include The Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland with Bad Hats and Soul Pepper Theatre, Emmy in Caroline or Change, and Edwina in Passing Strange with Musical Stage Company and Obsidian Theatre, Mary Poppins in Mary Poppins, and Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz with Young People's Theatre. Grand Hotel, The Magician's Nephew, and an Octoroon at the Shaw Festival, and Kinky Boots with Mervish Theatre. Vanessa has also done work in film and television in shows such as Tall Boys, Too Close for Christmas, Love in the Wilds, and Suits. She is the winner of Dora Awards for Caroline or Change, Kinky Boots, and The Wizard of Oz. She was critics pick for Mary Poppins and Passing Strange, for which she also won the Toronto Theatre Critics Award. So thank you both so much for being here this morning. Um, for those of you watching, so Meet the Festival is an interactive Q&A style. Um, I encourage you as you're watching, if you have questions to please put them in the chat for Vanessa and Marcus. Um, and to start us off as people are thinking about whether they and what questions they would like to ask you, I have some prepared, so we'll walk through them. I wonder if we could start with you. Um, could you talk a little bit about your background how did you get started in the business and what brought you to the Stratford Festival? Um, Vanessa, maybe we could start with you. Sure. Um, I actually came to theater and musical theater in an unconventional way. Um, I really hadn't done it with any intention of pursuing a professional career. I was dead set on going to the University of Guelph and becoming a vet. And I'd had, you know, my acceptance and I was I'd had my scholarships and was all ready to go. Um, but I'd done community theater and um, I really, really loved it. Uh, and my mom really encouraged me to just apply for some post-secondary programs and by some miracle I got into Sheridan College. So I went there and was um, part of the first class that did the degree program there. So um, the program is continually changing and evolving, but that was like a huge, huge foundation of my, um, my training. Um, and then from school, the first show that I ever did was Kinky Boots um, with Mervish. And so it was, you know, you just graduate and you're meeting Cindy Lauper and Harvey Fars. You know, I was like, I think, I think I like it. I think I'm gonna stick around. So <laughs> I am uh, really, really happy to still be doing it. And the, the longer I do it, the longer, the longer I do it, the more I realize that there, there really isn't anything else that I want to do anymore. I don't think I could go back to like fantasizing about being a vet and all the math. I don't know. I'll, I'll take the stages, I think. 
Exactly. It seems much more fun than math, but some people love math. So, you know, I love math and that's fantastic yeah, because... to do it. And amazing. Do it than I do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And Marcus, could you tell us about, about your background? Well, I went to university on a clarinet scholarship. I was a, uh, an instrumental major. And um, to, to make a long story short, I was playing in the pit orchestra of the gondoliers. And I thought, I don't want to be under the stage. I want to be on the stage. And I, I envied the singer so much. So I started studying voice just for fun and absolutely loved it. And in my, I think it was my third year of university, I was preparing for my clarinet senior recital. And I was so unhappy. It was like my first experience with sort of depression. And I started to realize that, oh, I don't want to do this. I want to be a singer. So I, in a very odd choice in your third year of university, I switched to voice uh, and I've never turned back. I, d I don't regret it. <laughs> uh, and I love, singing and acting. I love everything that I do, but I never dreamed at that time that that's what I would end up doing because I was such a clarinet geek, such an orchestra, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, if somebody had told me then, oh, you'll, your future is you'll be in theater, I probably would have cried. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and Marcus, what brought you to the festival? How did you get started here? Oh my, uh, I auditioned for my one and only and it's kind of a funny story because uh, there, there was, I was working at Grand Bend and strangely enough, I had to drive from Grand Bend through Stratford to Toronto to audition for Stratford. And there was a traffic jam because it was a CNE at the time. Uh, and I was five minutes late, but I think I was the last performer because everyone had gone home. And I was so angry. I had like fought through traffic to get there and everyone was gone. So I was sort of like uh, complaining to the doorman. Then some guy came out of the washroom and said, oh, are you Marcus? And I whirled around and I said, yes, who are you? Just like that. And he goes, well, I'm the director of the show that you're, you're supposed to be auditioning for. And he said, everybody's gone home, but you know what? Let's go upstairs and sing the song that you brought and we'll just pretend it's American Idol, just no pianist, nobody in the room. So just sing this for me. So I went up and I sang for him and he was like, oh, I'm glad to hear you. I'm going to give you a call back. Uh, but I was so angry. I was still so wound up. So I was just angry that day. I was like, I'm not coming back. I'm not going to audition for them. Why did they not stay and wait for me for five minutes? Anyway, I ended up getting the job. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is history. It was Michael Lichtefeld and he still laughs about that story. That's amazing. Oh, you just never know. Does it, it does, obviously it doesn't matter. Maybe the emotions helped. It's great. <laughs> um, we do have a, we have a question from somebody watching. Um, they're wondering what is it like performing under the canopy with a smaller audience this season? Do you miss the energy generated by the audience in a large theater? Maybe we can ask both of you how you feel about that. Um, Vanessa, would you like to start? Sure. Um... First and foremost, it's awesome because it's been a year without live audiences. So absolutely, it is different. Um, at times, it is a little strange because it's it's a different energy. I think something that we've kind of noticed throughout previews and now that we've opened um, is that because the audience is distant, I mean, forget about the fact that like the house doesn't come down and everyone doesn't disappear into darkness and have that anonymity of just being a part of a crowd. Also, not only are you in broad daylight and everyone can see everyone, you're also distanced. So everyone is in their little pods, in their little households um, for safety, of course. But what it does is it does kind of, I think, remind people or give them more of a, a self-awareness of how they're reacting. Um, so that's that's been interesting sometimes to kind of like, I feel like we kind of, guide the audience into comfort and it, it's a little more I feel like it, is, it isn't just inherent in entering the theater and saying I know what this is I know what the theater is and what my my role as an audience member is like I know how I contribute to this event and to this interaction and this exchange we kind of have to say like it's okay we've, we've still got you it's different hi lady in the front row I can see you but it's it's still it's still us taking care of you and taking you on on a lovely little journey. But um, 
I think that one of the strangest things, this is my first time doing theater outdoors. Um, and I think one of the strangest things is like the, the clarity with which we can see the audience. Like it, there's just, there's no hiding anything. But one of the things that I have started to really love about that is um, A, since it's been such a long time, so many people are coming and receiving so intensely the joy and the relief and and the release as well and so we're seeing a lot of people you know the first time you hear notes enter the space it's just like oh instant tears it's just game over and i love that because i feel the same and b i really love watching people who are closing their eyes and just letting the music wash over them that's really really interesting to me so yeah it's it's different it's um strange but also kind of familiar that's a long-winded answer but I like no, it it's wonderful because it is such a it's been such a long time since anybody's had a chance to be an audience member and and or be on the stage and so it's great to hear your reactions to that and see what audiences are doing Marcus how do you feel about being back and working outside I couldn't have said it better than what Vanessa just said like it's exactly the same for me word for word um I normally like to hide on the stage like I, I'm f comfortable seeing my cast members but I really don't like seeing an audience I love a dark theater because I'm also easily distracted so if, if somebody looks at their watch I will see that and if somebody is weeping um, I will see that um, the, the other day there were some kids on the other side of the fence jumping up and down and they were trying to distract and that was a bit strange. Like I'm fine with people who walk by and are enjoying it as they walk by on the other side. And we can kind of see it, but it's just a bit weird, the, the distractions. But, um, but you know, having said all that, we, we are so happy to be performing. And, you know, I, we really didn't think it was going to happen until the last minute, because you just never know. We never knew what the government would say. We never knew what, how, where the numbers would be. Um, so once we started performing, we were ecstatic. Like I, I cried. I couldn't read the last poem on the first, our first run because I was so emotional. Um, but I love it. I love kind of nature. I love, I, we even the thunderstorms, the rain kind of is, is like a, a fifth character in our show because it definitely speaks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's sometimes it's kind of exciting. Opening night, we had to stop. Uh, almost well, we were about 25 minutes to the end and we had to stop. Audience had to go to safety. We had to go to safety. And then we came back out and the audience was ecstatic. It was something exciting, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're going with the flow. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It seems like that's so important this year in all areas to just be able to go with the flow. But it is amazing to be able to have live performances. I expect that they're creating a great ambiance in the area as well for those people who can hear it. Um, it, even if they can't see you while they're while you're performing. Um, we're gonna jump around a little bit. I want to go back a little bit to um, Vanessa. I'm wondering, um, so you were raised in a small town of Deep River, Ontario, and I'm wondering how do you think that informed um, your development and work as an artist? Mm, I think that honestly, it actually is is one of the biggest reasons that I do what I do. I think coming from a really small town, there was such a sense of community, of safety and of care. Um, I, I love feeling like your family and like everyone gets along and like everyone's there for each other. And I love that like safety net and that sort of, you know, anywhere you go, you know, you know, who, who lives down the street from you. And I think that when I found that feeling reflected in theater, you know, you, you go out and it's your first day and you meet this group of people and it's just very often, it's like an instant little family and you all kind of fall in love with each other and get to know each other and go on this beautiful journey and, and grow together. And I think it reminded me of home. It felt like coming home in a lot of ways. So I really think that that was, um, a huge part of it. But of course, there's also on the other side, coming from this really small town, there was this great excitement about going to a big city and performing for a crowd of thousands of people because that's not something you can get in, you know, the, the auditorium of 400 people in the high school at Deep River. So, <laughs> so it, it was really, really cool to, you know, it, it does seem 
big and exciting and different and scary in a great way. So I think that it's it's really interesting that part of it is familiarity and safety and comfort, and part of it is challenge and risk and putting yourself out there in the big city and seeing seeing if you make it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting how that all, all those things are important and they all come together to give you the experiences that you have as an artist to be cool in that way. That's really interesting how different um, grow experiences growing up can feed into your art. Mm -hmm. But I definitely, you know, I, I carry um, my high school drama teacher, Alison McIver with me. I, I carry so many of like the community theater community members with me. I like, it, it was those people that said, you know, I know this is, this is Deep River, but I think you should really consider this. So I, I work hard to make them proud. <laughs> Vanessa is very, also very humble. Like I see her as a huge star. You just read this resume. She's very young and the resume is ridiculous. <clears throat> but I think your background has made you very humble. And that's why you're so good. Because you keep working hard, even though great things are happening for you. It's true. It's quite the impressive list of credits that you have on, on your resume. Nice way to start the day. I'm gonna have someone read my resume to me every day, every morning. Oh, yeah. great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Marcus, you have a really a big variety of musical genres in your background and experience, and all the way from like from musical theater to opera to classical concerts. And I'm wondering, what do you feel are the differences in performing in those genres, if there are differences? Um, do you have a favorite one or one that feels the most comfortable to you? Oh, wow. That's a tough question. Um, I love intim the intimacy of concerts and cabaret. And my cabarets are always a combination of the two. So it, there's the, the uh, informality of, of uh, cabaret, but I always also like the formality of, of concert. So I really like presentation. Um, um, and, and, and you will see that in, uh, why we tell the story. I call it black excellence. <laughs> I just like, like I was raised to, uh, as a black person to, uh, whatever I did to have it at a high level. My parents were, were very proud of who they were, but, th but they, uh, came up in an era where uh, they they had to show their best always, or they felt the need to show their best always. Not not a pressure, uh, not a, but uh, something that, that was uh, prideful. Um, uh, so so that is 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 part of of my presentation. But that's not quite what you asked. Um, I I I I don't get bored, but I just I I just as I get older, I like to put my foot in different waters. You know, I started out, like I said, as a clarinet player, and then I wanted to sing, and then I was an opera singer for the longest time, and then I thought, oh, music theater looks like so much fun, and then I love that, and then there was cabaret, then there was jazz, concert, I just, I want to do everything, and now TV film a little bit, I'm trying to catch up with Vanessa in that area. <laughs> You're doing fine yourself. <laughs> but I, I... I just, I, you know, during the pandemic, uh, all of us have learned so much about ourselves that we put our foot, feet in different uh, waters. And I, I just think that's the way to be an artist. You know, why not do it all? It's also the easiest way to keep your finances coming in, just, just not to be uh, uh, settled in one area. So, yeah, I love it all. And I put it all together and I, I become my own entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's similar in a way to what Vanessa was saying about bringing the small town and the big city together, bringing all the different genres just makes you a more full person, makes the art really interesting, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering, um, so Vanessa, you've had some experience performing for young audiences um, in addition to your work for general audiences. And I'm wondering, what do you love about working for theater for young audiences and how does it differ maybe from doing a show for general audiences? Well, um, it, honestly, it's it's not terribly different because, um, well, I have been very, very lucky to work with companies like the Shaw Festival and Young People's Theatre in Toronto, who really understand that theatre for young people actually just means the best possible art. Because 
it's it's not about playing it down or you know trying to to baby something it's actually the exact opposite it's really saying this is important and this matters and um you know oftentimes in in the programming of a season like that when it's aimed at young audiences there will of course be uh, a lesson or a tidbit or something you can as a family talk about afterwards and say oh that was really interesting you know oh when dorothy and the wizard of oz was really scared and all alone have you ever felt like that like is was it comforting to know that you're always carrying your way home with you and that actually she had it all all along like those are all themes that can be you know taken out and and be great conversation afterwards but you know you're still absolutely doing doing the show the play the musical with the intention of being like we want to be phenomenal performers and take these children on a journey um also children are much harsher critics much harsher critics. If a kid is bored, you know, if, if someone in, in the audience at the Stratford Festival is bored, they will probably respectfully, you know, kind of be like, okay, I'm not super interested, but all right, let's settle in for this show. If a kid is bored, they will start smacking Jimmy beside them. They will start, you know, putting gum in Susie's hair. They will just get up and walk out and a teacher will have to, you know, go corral them. They'll say, I have to pee. I'm bored. Like, they will let you know. So you are working double time to keep the attention of, you know, hundreds of school children. It's, it's different, but I really love it. Um, oftentimes because they're school shows, you do performances much earlier in the day, which I don't love. It's hard to sing that high C at 10 a.m. That's not my favorite part. But um, generally speaking, I, I really do love it um i love the energy i love the honesty um children are just you know they they receive magic in such a a beautifully honest way and i think um a lot of times theater is trying to reconnect um our general audiences and our adult audiences with the inner child and it's really beautiful to have a group of kids who haven't learned to filter yet or um who don't know a lot of the tricks of the trade and haven't seen, you know, stagecraft a thousand times. So they're still mystified when, when these things happen and they don't, you know, they're not trying to predict the end of a story. They're really there and they're super present. Um, so I really, really love that. I think every actor should work for young people at least once or twice in their career because it is humbling and it is so exciting and so much fun. That's amazing. I just think it's so magical for kids going to the theater and I probably a little bit biased because I work in education. But at the same time, I remember as a kid going to the theater and the magic I felt even in the dark theater before the play even started, like and the anticipation of what we were going to see. And so it's so wonderful um, to give kids that opportunity. Um, so now both of you have had these experiences working in the in the different genres and stuff. And now I feel like a cabaret is something different again. And you've touched on this a little bit when you were talking about what it's like to perform outside and, and getting back into it. But I'm just wondering, um, how does doing a cabaret differ from maybe doing something like Little Shop of Horrors or uh, The Wizard of Oz? And um, how do you feel, um, like, how does that, how do you approach that as an artist when you're not necessarily looking at a character um, to develop as well? Um, maybe Marcus, we could start with you and then I'd love to hear what, Vanessa what you think as well. For me, it's very natural because I was I, I was trained as a classical singer and part of being trained as a classical singer is learning how to do recital, learning how to plan a recital. Um, so there's a lot of singing alone. There's a lot of not being a, necessarily a character, but doing a string of songs um, that are of different characters. So for me, the whole cabaret thing came very naturally. Um, what I loved about it that was different from doing concerts, concerts was the, uh, the intimacy and the casualness of it. I could actually talk to the audience um, and the audience loves that. Even, even classical audiences love it when the singer breaks the fourth wall and, and, and there is a conversation, you get to know a little bit of, about them. But it comes pretty easily for me. Um, there is there you, you can hide in in a actual musical or opera or play you hide behind your character and you don't have to engage with the audience some people prefer that um that's probably easier um but um i do like both equally 
that's great. And Vanessa, what do you, what about you? How do you feel about it? Yeah, um, that is, you hit the nail on the head, Marcus. I am someone who is generally in the other camp and mostly because that's like what I've trained in and what I feel really confident in is having a character and saying, you know, yes, I'm, I'm bringing parts of Vanessa. Um, you know, it's, it's part of our craft, part of the job to make that character three-dimensional by bringing elements of ourselves, but you always have the safety net of saying, this isn't me. Maybe I can explore something uglier inside of me through this ugly character, or maybe I can explore something that I love about myself and don't get to show all the time through this other character. But it's always this safety, the safety veil of being like, but it's just me pretending. It's not, it's not actually Vanessa saying and doing these things. Um, and you get to live vicariously through all of your characters. And with concert and with cabaret, it's you, it's you out there. And that's really intimidating to me. Um, I have always like had a big hesitation around, you know, doing pop performances and cabaret and saying like, let me really just tell you my story now, because of course then when you have um, a reviewer or just a judgmental, audience a judgmental viewer and I mean you know judgmental meaning like literally you you take what you receive and then you form an opinion about it that opinion is now about me Vanessa the person and so that can be really scary it's vulnerable in a very very different way um but I think I really am learning to love it um doing up close and musical this past year with Stratford was like a really eye-opening experience because I did not know how to plan and build a cabaret and we had a lot of help and support excuse me, support in doing that. Um, so it was really exciting. So I did feel, I feel a little more prepared every time I come back to a show that is like, okay, and here we're gonna do a bunch of things and we're kind of either crafting our own narrative or like dipping into a character for a moment and then going somewhere else and then coming out as me, Vanessa in a different moment. Um, but I'm, I'm getting more and more comfortable the more I do it. So I think a lot of the hesitancy did come from the fact that I just, I have training in musical theater and that's what I feel confident that I know how to do. And um, I, I felt less comfortable in the world of recital and concert and cabaret. And now that I've got a little more experience doing that, I'm really, really enjoying it. And certainly this show, Marcus has crafted such a fantastic journey for the audience, but also for the performers. Um, it's a very, very thoughtful production. It's uh, really, really done with care and with love. So it it is, um, this show is definitely just like pure joy to do. You know, it's not, it's not scary to drop into this one. This one's just fun. Excellent. I'd like to talk a little bit more about that cabaret in a minute. We do have a question from one of our, the people who are joining us today. And so we'll go to that one first. I was wondering what has it been like getting ready for just one production rather than repertory? And how is it living and rehearsing in a pod to remain safe? <laughs> Talk about the difference this season feels from most of them. Um, maybe Marcus, would you like to start with that? Uh, I think rehearsing in the pod was really strange at first, um, but I think we got used to it. We, we were singing at the beginning with plexiglass between us and in front of us. And we had these very strange masks on that were pressing on the nose and pressing underneath the chin. So we had to kind of get used to that because usually you want lots of freedom. Um, we're doing rapid tests and checking in every day. Um, and uh, we're not supposed to really fraternize with people from other shows because we're trying to protect the show. So if someone gets sick in one show, they don't get someone sick in another. So it's a bit odd and it's a lot of extra work and thought. Um, but if it means that we get to perform, we're fine with that. Um, what was the other part of the question? What is it like getting ready for just one production instead of multiple? Oh, um, I don't know. It's because it's a cabaret, it's very different. And a cabaret with these cabarets, it's big singing. So it's, it's a, we're giving enough energy for the one, um, and we're doing eight of them a week. Um, so I, I think we're naturally falling into this new pattern. It seems to fit with the cabaret. It might be different if it was a play or a musical. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Vanessa, how about you? How are you feeling about the all the setup this year? Yeah. Um, is yeah. I, I think I echo everything that Marcus has said. It was definitely 
uh, strange and overwhelming to, you know, be receiving all these health and safety protocols. And of course, we're so, so grateful for all of the incredible work that so many people, so many people have done. Like the meetings are daily, the, the updates that like everyone is being so, so, so safe because of course we all desperately want this to happen and to continue to happen. So um, yeah, it was a lot more um, front loaded uh, in terms of information Usually on the first day of rehearsal, you know, you, you get a lot of information, but a lot of it is like the design presentation and like, this is what the set will look like. And we have your costume sketches and it's like, oh, and this was like, this is where you should go if you feel sick. This is the number you should call. Please don't come in if this, this is all of the, the, the plexiglass will be here. But like, it was a very different onslaught of information. Um, all received with gratitude, but definitely like, whoa, right. We're doing this. We're doing this. And there is a different, a different attitude coming into the room. Um, but yeah, it was I was I was also very lucky because I got to do Alice in Wonderland with um, Bad Hats Theater. So I'd had the experience of working with plexiglass and navigating um, a, a COVID safe rehearsal hall. Um, so I kind of I kind of knew what I was getting into. Um, I think the strangest thing is, you know, having done this uh, work at Stratford before repertory theater one of the huge joys of it is that you see so many people you know you go up to the green room to grab your coffee or you know you're signing in backstage and you see people from different shows and different casts and you get to catch up and say hi and and i really love that and it's definitely been um a, a shift to be like oh it's just it's this little tiny pod um so in some ways it just feels like you're doing a show a regular show that's not in rep where you just have your your cast and your crew and those are the people you see and that's cool but doing that in a building where my body is like but where are the other people was <laughs> a bit of a shift um but in terms of you know doing one production and not having to prep for uh, a, a two-show day of, of different material um it is i think you know a bit easier in some respects like i don't have to do a physical warm-up to do a dance break <laughs> i don't have to um Actually, the first couple of previews, I, I did do quite a beat. Like I did the eyeshadow and the makeup and the whole thing because I'm used to putting on stage makeup. And um, now I kind of love that, you know, if, if I'm feeling like I want to be cute, I can still do that. But on a day where I'm kind of like, eh, like we're outside, it, you know, it's the audience is nine feet away. I don't need to like accentuate and highlight. I can just be like, yeah, this is my face. I can put on like mascara and lipstick and be like, cool, great, that's all I need. So mm -hmm. I like that. Um, but in terms of cabaret specifically, this is for sure the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, in musical theater, you might have one or two like big, intense, hard, heavy songs. Like, you know, if you're, uh, you know, a lead in the show, sure, you're on stage for a lot of the time, but you have breaks where the ensemble has a big number or, you know, you're, you're doing a duet and there's like different, there's ebb and flow. And of course there's ebb and flow in a cabaret as well, but it is like 90 minutes of nonstop. You are just, you are singing go, 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 go. So that, that has been a learning curve for me of like, oh, this takes a different kind of stamina, a different kind of vocal warm up, a different kind of bodily presence. So all of those things are, you know, always being factored into, factored into the scenario. And I think we've got a, a really amazing group because we all do take such care with each other and check in. And, um, you know, Robert Marcus is like the lozenge guy. We're like, mm -mm -mm. I feel like I'm just gonna steal one of those. You know, I go out onto the stage, the festival stage to warm up um, each day. Cause I know if I don't, I'm like, no, we gotta, we gotta take care and be really safe. Whereas in a musical, a lot of the time I'm like, <laughs> you know, I've got three, three big ensemble numbers before I have to do a solo. So I can actually like kind of warm up throughout. That's bad, I shouldn't do that. I don't recommend that, but it is. <laughs> A bad habit that I have. Um, so yeah, it's it's different. Um, it is a different level of stamina, especially after not working in this way for a year. Like it's not even like we're at our peak athleticism of you know I've been doing this eight shows a week for five years. It's like oh I just had a sixteen month break where I was not singing, and now we've got to be like back at it. Um, but 
yeah, it's it's been it's been really kind of dreamy, I think, to to have this as like the the return. Yes, that's wonderful. It would be. It's I think everybody's feeling so excited about being able to um be back in watching performances and there's something about music that is just so at least it really speaks to you it's amazing how much um music can can talk to each individual people and in different ways um let's talk about the cabaret a little bit now um some people are getting a chance to see it which is so wonderful um where i know a lot of uh, the rest of us who can't necessarily get there will be able to see it when it's filmed and um shown later on um but maybe could you talk, Marcus, a little bit about um, what first inspired you to create this cabaret? And we have a question that ties into that, um, talking about, can you discuss the process of selecting songs and poems for the cabaret? Mm. Can you give us a little bit of background about how it was um, developed? Yeah. Um, actually, I was on the beach of Fort Lauderdale. And every day I would walk to Starbucks, I would get my coffee, I would get my breakfast sandwich, and I would go out on the beach uh, and I would sit there and with my computer <laughs> and I would just work on what this was going to be. And it kind of fell together in an easy manner. Um, all of my life, whenever I perform, I always make sure that there is uh, an element of, of, of black art in it. So, um, I thought this would be a great opportunity to do an entire program of black music theater. Um, and I really wanted to choose songs from musicals that I was frustrated uh, with the fact that we're not being done in Canada. Um, so I thought, well, here's a great opportunity to have people see that we have singers who can actually do this, meaning that we can act, we can go beyond just this cabaret and do these shows in the theaters at Shaw, at Stratford, at, in London, in downtown Toronto, we can do these shows. Um, so, so there was a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, trying to prove a point as well as wanting to celebrate um, uh, these great musicals. So I picked a lot of songs from musicals that people knew, but I also wanted to choose songs from musicals that people didn't know, like Pearly. Um, I'm not even sure everyone knows the life. Uh, so I wanted to, to do some of those as well as, of course, Porgy and Bess and uh, Hamilton. Um, and then there's the whole idea of how do you piece them together? And usually it's personal stories or just bantering with the audience. But I thought, why don't we build on that celebration and celebrate some of our great poets? So I came across some wonderful Langston Hughes poems that are so, so pertinent for 2021. Um, and, and then some Maya Angelou poems that were beautiful. And, and I put those together and they all seemed to work really beautifully with the songs that I had chosen. For example, Robert Marcus reads uh, a Maya Angelou poem called Human Family. It describes uh, a bigger family than just individual race, the human family. And then he sings family from dream girls. And it's just a beautiful kind of, of connection. Um, yeah. And that's kind of how it came about. I definitely wanted allyship uh, included. So that's why Robert Marcus is helping us celebrate black music theater. Um, plus we, we need a Huckleberry Finn. We need a Rodimaeus. Um, we, there are lots of characters that, uh, help tell the story in those musicals and Robert plays that part as well. There's a follow-up question that kind of ties in with this as well. And is it a typical format for a cabaret that music and poetry is read rather than from memory? I don't know if you have people. It could be either or. Okay. But because we had just a, a week to put this together, we are... That makes sense. Mm -hmm. We have a bit another question that ties in, and we'll come back to a little bit more of the content of um, the cabaret in a minute. But somebody's wondering: Do the cast wear their own clothing, or are they wearing costumes? <laughs> Vanessa, would you like to answer that? 
own clothing. <laughs> um, although we certainly had support from the festival if we wanted to do um, costumes, but of course the festival's warehouse is mostly full of beautiful period pieces. So um, I think everyone is wearing their own clothing. I am, however, wearing a pair of show shoes from the festival that were custom dyed to match a color that's in the dress that I brought from home. So I've got, I've got a little festival magic on my feet. <laughs> Very nice. That's excellent. It's just nice to know all those little background details. It really helps to make it a full experience. And it's fun to learn about what's going on behind the scenes like that. Um, so Marcus, the, the title of the cabaret being Why We Tell the Story is borrowed from the award-winning musical Once on This Island. And I'm wondering, can you talk about it? What is it that you love about that musical? Oh, well, I think that musical is is there, there aren't a lot of musicals out there that sort of go towards our ancestors i think lion king does i think once on this island does and um i, I love paying tribute to the people before a lot of the langston hughes poems sort of add to that negro mother um is one um about uh the captured african who who goes through this journey and survives so that Vanessa and I can exist. Um, um, but I was really drawn towards that particular song, Why We Tell the Story from the musical. I thought, what a perfect song. The song lists all these reasons why we tell the story, faith, hope, love, family, pain. And I thought, well, that's a great song to base the whole cabaret on. Let's just take each of those categories and choose songs of pain, songs of hope, songs of family, and celebrate. And then at the end, we sing this great poem, uh, this great song, why we tell the story. And at the end of it, it says, you are why we tell the story. So we are um, inviting our audience to go out and continue to tell our story, no matter what race they are. Tell our stories, be our allies. Um, yeah, that's how this Amazing. came That's fantastic. We have a, another question about it, and it's, um, I'd like to ask both of you this question. What is your favorite song to sing, or what is your favorite part of the cabaret? Um, you know, Vanessa, would you mind starting with that one? Oh, I love them all. I really love them all. But I think um, it's probably the, the scariest song to sing because it comes right near the end. Um, but I do love getting to sing I'm Here from The Color Purple. Um, you know, I think that show has been done twice in Canada, both times directed by Kimberly Rampersad. Like it's, it, it should be everywhere all the time. It is a perfect show. The music is incredible. The story is phenomenal. And it has been so, so wonderful to get to sing that music for a live audience. Um, it's incredibly powerful. It's uh, a great, as are all of the songs, it's a great piece of storytelling where you really get to go on this character's journey. And um, it's, it's, it's a hard thing when we did this show as a one night only in 2019, I think I cried through half of the song because it's, it's just, it's so emotional and true. It's so true and it's, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, but thankfully now we're doing it a couple of times so I can, you know, build up a little more, <laughs> you know, be a little stronger through it. Um, but it's it's so it's so incredibly powerful, and it, it feels like a gift that I am receiving, simultaneously a gift that I am giving. It's it's just so beautiful, and every time I get to it, I'm like, I don't know if this is gonna come out. This is a hard one to sing, and then it's like, but the story comes through. So you just you're just there in service of the story, um, which is so so awesome. But like all the music is so good. <laughs> come see the show. <laughs> <laughs> and Marcus, do you have a favorite song or part of the show? First, I want to say when Vanessa sings that song, the whole cast cries. <laughs> Literally, we do. We're blown away. I like Vanessa. I like all my songs. I love They Live in You um, because it is a tribute to the ancestors. Um, and, and there's something very indigenous about it, too, as well. The indigenous community is so in tune with their ancestors and I, I admire that so much. So I love that about They Live In You. 
But probably my favorite song to sing, and it's a surprise to me, is Old Man River. Because for many, many, many years, I hated being asked to sing it because I just felt that it was assumed that I would. <laughs> would sing it. I was like, wait a minute, I could sing other things. I could sing in Italian, I could sing in French. Um, why do you always want to hear that song? Um, but I reluctantly said yes to performing it at a concert. And at the end of one of the performances, this old farmer came up to me and he was one of these gentlemen that you imagined his wife probably pulled him to this, this show, to this concert. And he could barely speak. He was in tears, but he shook my hand and he had this rough farmer's hand and he had this sunburned face and he started to cry. And he said, you have no idea what that song has done for me. And I just decided then and there, I, I'm going to get over myself and I'm going to share this great song and this great message to whomever wants to hear it. Oh, amazing. You just never know the reaction that somebody might be having. It's so nice that they that he came up and told you about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, do you have either of you, maybe both of you have something, what do you think might surprise audiences most about this cabaret? Hmm. I think um, actually something that gets received in a surprising way or that people just aren't expecting when they hear the word cabaret is the poetry, actually. I think that that's a really, um, you know, as Marcus mentioned a lot of time with cabaret, it's kind of like banter or personal stories. And there's something that is elevated and heightened about the poetry, but that also is again, so honest and so real. Um, it's also like a, a surprise and a pleasure for the performers to get to recite that kind of material. Um, and, you know, we, we worked on it. We had like our, our voice coach come in and, and work with us. And, you know, Marcus selected these poems very carefully and was very, um, you know, specific in who he, who he wanted performing each piece. Um, but I think it's, it, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a delightful surprise. And I think a lot of people, um, forget that, you know, like Shakespeare, poetry is meant to be heard, you know? Not to say that you can't appreciate it when you're going through a book of poems, that's lovely, but it is different to speak the words, to feel them in your mouth and to receive them. Um, it's, 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 I think, surprising to people. People are moved and really listening and really in tune and saying, wow, I didn't, maybe I didn't know that piece or maybe I'm hearing it in a new way for the first time, or maybe in the context of this show, it's illuminated in a different way. So I think the poems are a really fabulous surprise for a lot of people. Excellent. And Marcus, do you have anything you would like to add about that? What do you no, think? I think you will be, people will be surprised to see Marcus Nance, who is not a dancer, actually. I'm the only one in this one who dances. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, so Oh, go ahead, Marcus. Did you have? Oh, no, I was going to say that's it. <laughs> I will leave it there because it has to be a surprise. OK, well, that's fair enough. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, the poetry, which is amazing. And I'm wondering, um, so there's Marcus, you spoke a little bit about this earlier on, about the uh, expressions of musical theater and poetry by the African-American community. And I'm wondering, um, what do you see as the relationship between music and poetry? And as an artist, what do you uniquely love about each? Um, I, what I love is pertaining to this cabaret particularly is that two things. Music heightens words. Um, and, and I really think that uh, the audience really, uh, the, the, these, Song can really affect the emotion in a way that just speaking does not. But I also think that sometimes people could get distracted by us singing. Oh, they'll hear a beautiful tone. So they might stop hearing the words and listen to the tone or what the singer is doing or the music. So it's kind of nice to give them a chance to not be distracted by music. And you are going to hear these words. And some of them are harsh. <laughs> some of them are pointed. Some of them are beautiful. Um, so it's kind of, I think, great to go back and forth and give the audience a break or give the audience some height. Um, yeah, I think it works well together. 
Excellent. Yeah. Um, we have another question. We touched on a little bit when we were talking about going back into performance and what it's like outside. They're wondering, how does it feel to be performing outside at the mercy of the weather? And I'm wondering, how much is the weather affecting how you feel about going into performance and also during the performance? Um, Vanessa, would you like to start with that? Sure. It is wild. It's wild. Um, and in both, you know, challenging and exciting ways. Um, I think there's something incredibly magical about Nima singing summertime and hearing birds chirping and babies laughing. And it's like, oh my God, it's so alive. It's so alive. And sometimes nature really does just like support you and um, highlight a beautiful moment in a way that you couldn't do, you know, even if you got like a soundtrack of birds in a theater, like it's, it's different than having like an actual, an actual bird song. Um, and it's also super, super challenging. Like Marcus mentioned on our opening night, we had to take a break because of the rain. Um, and thankfully it did kind of calm down and we were able to return to the stage. But there is the reality that, um, you know, knock on wood, it doesn't happen, but it, it might that we aren't able to return to the stage if, if the show is um, rained out. Uh, it's definitely very strange to kind of just be on such a high alert with the weather, you know, like we have two shows today and I'm looking at the clouds going, okay, Oh, well, all right. Like there's, there's a, something very strange about not knowing for sure whether you're going to do a show that day. Um, and we've been very lucky so far and we've, we've done everything, which has been awesome. But then also there are magical moments brought on even by bad weather. Um, just the other day, Marcus was singing Old Man River and the rain came crashing down. And I swear it it supported Marcus's choices dynamically, you know, like it was like thundering on the tent during these incredibly, you know, torturous dark moments. And then it would lighten up for this moment of breath. And it was, it was really, really magical. And, um, you know, on, on opening night, Nima did That's Love um, amongst like <laughs> these crazy winds. And it was like this fierce goddess of, you know, owning her sexuality and owning her femininity. And the, you know, the wind is whipping her dress and it's, it's exciting. And then of course, yeah, I think, um, I think Marcus touched on this earlier, but audiences kind of love when something goes wrong. You know, they're like, ooh, I was at the show when X, Y, Z. Like that's really exciting. And it actually bonds everyone in the room together in this unique way, because the joy of live performance is that it's always um, a unique experience. Even if you're doing the same show over and over, every audience is different. Therefore, every show is different. But then, you know, add lightning and thunder. And it's like, it's really different. <laughs> Exactly. Marcus, do you have anything you'd like to add? How is it feeling for you? You know, as long as the show, we can finish the show, I'm fine with the elements of weather. There was one, you know, it's funny because while we're on stage, like Vanessa said, I can see the clouds and I could see if thunder's coming. And uh, I think it was opening uh, after we had come back. I could see that the storm was coming back again. So I, I actually read one of my poems really quickly. <laughs> Not in the way that I normally would because I didn't want them to miss Vanessa's last song. <laughs> oh, we gotta do that song! Um, but I, I, I'm kind of enjoying the elements. I have no problems. As long as we, as long as the audience gets to see the entire vision, I'm okay. Great. It's nice when it can add to it um, mm -hmm. in the ways that Vanessa was talking about too. Like it, that is an amazing um, new experience that we don't usually get at the festival. So that's kind of makes it another unique thing about this season there. Um, Vanessa talked a little bit, she just brought this up, and I know that people do love stories about um, when things go wrong. And I'm wondering, both of you have done a lot of shows in your career so far. And I'm wondering, is there a time when um, you've made a mistake on stage or something has gone wrong on stage that stood out? And how do you manage that? Because I think there's also that feeling of somebody who's not usually on stage, the fear of what if something does go wrong and how do you handle it? Um, I'm wondering if there's a story or anything like that that comes to mind um, and for, for that. Maybe, uh, Marcus, do you mind if we start with you? Oh, sure. I mean, this is the thing the audience doesn't know, but cast members usually live for those moments. <laughs> Not the person who it happens to, but everyone else lives for those moments because, you know, when you're doing a show eight times a week for months and months and months, it's sometimes something like that perks you up. Uh, uh, 
Uh, when I was in university, I was doing a Handel opera and uh, no disrespect, but a, a lot of Handel sounds similar. So a lot of the arias will sound a bit similar. And so there was one day I thought that it was my entrance time and I walked on stage and I was playing Julius Caesar and it was the wrong time. And, and uh, uh, Cleopatra was about to sing her a big aria that had nothing to do with me. I wasn't even supposed to hear those words. I wasn't supposed to know. Everyone in the wings, everyone was in the wings watching, waiting to see what I was going to do. So basically I pretended to hide and overhear what she was saying. And then when she left, then it was my turn to, 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 to sing. Um, but that was embarrassing. <laughs> but it happens, things happen. Exactly. And, yeah. Vanessa, do you have a story that comes to mind? Oh, so many. <laughs> it is. Marcus is absolutely right. We love it. We love it because it keeps things fresh and exciting. And, you know, of course, you know, barring injury, that that is not fun. But, um, you know, we've all had the experience of, you know, forgetting a line or having to, you know, you kind of, you skipped a part. So you go back and you're watching the conductors go like, you're on your own, buddy. Like you, you gotta figure that out. Um, so I think those are actually really, really common and probably happen a lot of time. The audience actually doesn't know that it's happened. We are problem solving all the time on stage or, you know, you show up and the scene hinges on the arrival of this prop and the prop is not there. And you go, ah, the vase that I imagine. Like you just have to figure your way out through it. But one of my favorite stories, um, is actually from an octoroon at the Shaw Festival. And uh, Andre Sills and I, Andre, who's also in the season this year, um, we're doing this, you know, it's a very melodramatic piece. It's very heightened, it's very stylized. Um, and we're playing these two lovers and I am in the most beautiful gown, just stunning. And you know, it's classic, like you're leaning against the wall and you're, you're swooning over each other and they're telling, you know, I love you, I love you. And I had to make this big dramatic exit through the aisle. So I was going off the front of the stage into the audience and then running away, you know, dress trailing behind me, such drama, such glamor. And my dress caught on a footlight and I ate it. I fell so hard. I went like down the stairs and then just slammed into the ground. And I will never forget this kind gentleman in the audience, like didn't know if it was part of the play and everyone kind of gasped, but then was like, can I help you? And I'm trying to be like, no, no, it's, it's, I always fall. This is part of the show. And I was like, you know, I fell and my dress came up over my head. Like my, my legs are kicking. Like it's just hysterical, like a cartoon. And I remember Andre is still on the stage trying so hard not to laugh, but he obviously like, we love each other. And he's like, you're a fool. And he's laughing at me. And he goes, Zoe, my love. Are you okay? And it was the funniest. It just absolutely broke me. So um, I don't know. I think those moments are hysterical. I wasn't even really terribly embarrassed. I was like, there's that was that was beyond my control. My dress caught on something. I have to go make another entrance in five minutes. I'm gonna run down the aisle and do the rest of the show. But I just I honestly I wish I could see a video of myself eating it off the front of the stage because it was just ridiculous. Ridiculous. That's a good story. Oh my god. <laughs> but they're they're a hazard you know <laughs> i think both of those stories and the examples are just some one of the things that is so wonderful about live theater and how um no matter what you can figure out how to keep the show going on and how it provides joy and laughter in a variety of what different ways whether it's meant or not mm -hmm. and it's just such a wonderful thing um to have it happening again. And I'm just noticing that we're actually out of time. And so Felix is actually kind of a nice note to end on because it's <laughs> a reminder of the fun of live theater. And so I wanna thank you, Marcus and Vanessa for being here this morning. It's been wonderful to chat with you. We're looking forward to seeing um, more opportunities to see the cabaret. And so I wish you all the best with the rest of the run of that show. And uh, thank you everyone for those of you who have joined us and watched and shared your questions. We have really appreciated hearing from you. And so um, join us like next Saturday at 10 o'clock. We have another Meet the Festival and it will be with artists from uh, You Can't Stop the Beat. So thank you again. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.